Good evening. I'm really happy to be on the of architecture. Thank you for joining us tonight for our new installment in the Techno Glass Lecture Series. This lecture is in a hybrid format, meaning that we have here students and faculty in the Glasgow Hall at the School of Architecture, but also we have students in our community joining us online, and of course our speaker tonight, Jason Brother, who will be joining us from Brazil. And my colleague, uh, Jaime Correa, will introduce our speaker tonight, but I want to take the opportunity to thank our sponsors, Technoglass, for their continued sponsorship. This is the sixth year that they are supporting our lecture series and allowing us to sustain this very ambitious uh, programming for our lectures. I remind you also that in addition to the Technoglass series, we have the current series which takes place on Monday evening. And we also have other program lectures in uh, from our real estate development program and our construction management program, I invite you to check our website, our website for the full list of all the programs that the School of Architecture offers. And here's my colleague, Jaime Correa. Uh, thank you, Dean. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jaime Correa, an associate professor in practice at the School of Architecture of the University of Miami and the coordinator of this lecture series. On behalf of the School of Architecture uh, and Technoblast, I would like to welcome you and Milton Braga from Sao Paulo, Brazil. But before we start, let me remind you to keep your microphones off at all times. As part of our revered honor system, Please do not, do not attempt to share our screen at any time. If you do, you will be removed and not allowed to come back. So again, please keep your microphones off at all times. At the end of this lecture, we will be honored to join a panel discussion led by Professor Roberto Behar, Luis Sousa, and Alice Singer. They have direct or indirect connection with Brazil and they're overqualified to take this distinguished role. So if you have any questions, or if you need any type of clarification, please use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen and the panelists will ask the questions on your behalf. Tonight, we're honored to host Milton Braga from MMDB in Sao Paulo. MMDB was founded in 1991 by Milton Braga, Fernando de Melo Franco, and Marta Moreira. They were all architects who graduated from the School of Architecture and Urbanism from the Universidad de Sao Paulo around 1986-1987. Among the former partners of MMDB are the prestigious and historic collaboration with Vinicius Gordati, Angelo Gucci and Fernando de Melo Franco, who is now named the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the city of Sao Paulo. As we will see in a moment, MMDB works on a wide range of scales and in very diverse contexts. Their architectural and urban projects are usually carried out in the form of associations and collaborations with different architects and consultants. These associations have yielded a range of projects that also include infrastructure, uh, such as urban corridors, bus terminals, monorails, garages, toll plazas, elevated walkways, etc. The firm has been recognized with several national and international awards, particularly for their contributions to the construction of urban MMDBs partnership with Paolo Mendes da Rocha has given them the opportunity to develop large projects for institutional and government agencies, destined for cultural, educational, political, and service activities, some of which you will see here tonight. 
In 2001, Milton Braga has been professor at the School of Architecture and Urbanism of the University of Sao Paulo, where he also graduated with a master's in architecture and a doctor degree. He has been a visiting professor at the School of Architecture of the University of Florida, a professor at the Universidad Sao Judas Adel in Sao Paulo, and a professor at the University of Brasburg, Cuba, in Monte da Cruz. Milton Braga is also the vice president of the Institute of Architecture of Brazil in Sao Paulo, and his book, O Concurso de Brasilia, Seven Projects for Capital, by Cossack Marini, published in 2010, took a second place in the 53rd Jabuti Award in the Architecture and Organization category, and first prize at the ex Atlas Award in the book category of the eighth Biennale Iberoamericana de Arquitectura y Urbanismo in Cadiz in 2012. On behalf of the School of Architecture of the University of Miami and Techno Lab, please let us welcome Milton Brown. Thank you very much. I couldn't unmute my phone. Uh, it's, a uh, it's a great pleasure to me to join all of you. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Curry, Mr. Correa. Uh, I think I could start my presentation. I will show some projects and I will share my screen. Uh, just a second. So I hope you are already seeing my screen. Okay, so I will start. Um, I'm, as Mr. Correa said, based in Sao Paulo. We are now uh, not a very, very big firm. Uh, for Brazilian standards, a medium-sized one, 15 people, it varies a little bit. And we make a lot of uh, cooperation because uh, this is a much easier way of enlarging the company and making it very uh, smaller when necessary. Sao Paulo uh, is very influential in our, in our work because it's a big city and full of problems. Uh, you are seeing an image taken from Copan building of the downtown area, which is quite consolidate and we could say it's going to be a modern city because it's like more or less New York made of modern buildings, although the, the urbanization, it's, it's a conventional one. And it grew a little, uh, very, very fast. This is perhaps the, the main, main reason for its big problems. As you can see on the figures, um, during the 20th century, we, we built 32 Brasilias, which is the Brazil's capital, was a design city, a planned city. You probably know it's a very important experience, modern experience. And it was meant at the beginning for 500,000 inhabitants. So uh, in, in 50 years, we built in Sao Paulo 30 Brasilias. And this is very difficult to do. So at the end, the city nowadays, uh, ends up based, uh, may, may, maybe with this kind of typical situation, uh, very unequal, big, big uh, differences between the, the way the rich and the poor live. Um, houses, which are very precarious, but at the, in the other hand, very important because they were built by the people themselves. And we could say that in Sao Paulo, in Brazil in general, maybe the most urgent task uh, for architects, it's much more to design what is in between houses, like streets and small streets, than the houses themselves. And this is something that we have been studying in our office, also in our academic life, uh, the importance of the infra infrastructure for the urban design, for the 
future of the city. And uh, in cities like the ones in Latin America, we are going to build a lot. Even the small spaces, uh, public spaces like this road in Paraisopolis, this favela, we could say that the public space is always made, made out of infrastructures. The ba material base of the public space are the, the infrastructural systems. In the roads, the capillar part of this, those systems. Therefore, the, the road is for the transportation systems, a system uh, also for the drainage system. Uh, you have the green infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have been thinking a little bit about uh, the way that the, the infrastructures in São Paulo could be successful. Um, this is perhaps the most typical view of the city, a city having already some uh, well done, let's say, parts mixed with very precarious or vulnerable, vulnerable parts. Uh, another problem of this kind of city is that uh, it's very fragmented, not very well planned, the urban fabric, like in this picture we can see, and if it's fragmented, not, uh, not having a, a good continuity in the small scale, on the other hand, is very homogeneous. This could be a picture of any of the poor areas of the Brazilian cities. And especially Sao Paulo, on, on the contrary of Rio de Janeiro, which is a wonderful city, mainly because it's in a wonderful place of the planet, natural place, in the encounter of the mountains of the Atlantic forest, as we, we call, and the Atlantic Ocean. And therefore, the city is modulated and is represented in a way by these natural elements. In Sao Paulo, the nature is very, very delicate, and it vanished facing uh, the, the, the urbanization of the metropolis. I, I think you saw the, the figures, 20,000 uh, million people in the metropolis, more or less, more than 20,000 nowadays. So how can you create elements that help people to locate themselves, that create uh, identities, that modulate, give rhythm for the uh, landscape, for the urban, the cityscape, and can uh, provide uh, representations of the city. This is very important. In Rio, as we can see in this picture, the natural elements cope with this, not in Sao Paulo, uh, anymore and not the, the big buildings. I saw that I took a picture from this building, the Copan building facing this central area. We, we call it the historic center built in the 20, 20s, as I said, not the 20s, in the 20th century, mainly in the second half of the 20th. But this building is not important anymore for the 20 million inhabitants. The ones that are uh, distant from this part, it's important in the local scale, not in, in the metropolitan scale. So how can we build these um, images capable of doing that? And infrastructures, like you, we can see in this picture, not very well done, uh, very poor fluvial park, having a bike lane beside uh, or on the side of a canal, uh, natural in the past, nowadays artificial, already gives a, a better um, presence for, for elements in, in the adequate scale of the metropolis. Also, the regulations can also build uh, landscapes or cityscapes that, that we really need. And as we know, infrastructure can be and has been very, very powerful in building beautiful gardens including or beautiful spots in cities like this very beautiful inf infrastructure maybe the most beautiful one for me in Beijing the canal that separates the forbidden city the city of the emperors of the rest of the city in the past for safety nowadays probably the most beautiful gardens of the city even more beautiful than the natural gardens or than the gardens qualified by natural elements like the big rivers so maybe infrastructure can be as powerful as nature, like we see in Paris. Paris is a city, a wonderful city, the city of light, and uh, maybe one of the major at at tourist attractions and is basically built. There is no natural element, not, not anymore. Everything is uh, built and basically infrastructure. So 
the first idea that I would like to leave with you is that public space is made out of infrastructures, the small ones by the capillar part of the, those networks and the big ones really necessary in the contemporary cities for uh, creating images of those metropolis. Sao Paulo is building a lot. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, big rings like the hydrofluvial ring, the motorway, motor, motorway ring, the uh, railway ring, lots of metro lines, monorail lines, metropolitan train lines, etc., etc. But we can't continue doing that only as engineering or only as a service. We have to apply an urban program to the infra infrastructures or to consider any work of infrastructure as an urban design project, as, as urban design, not anymore as only engineering. Even giving shape, a better shape for those, but not an urban program is not the way. Probably the way is to make much simpler and much more powerful in terms of life, in terms of programs, uh, infrastructures. Our most powerful public space is Avenida Paulista, a very ordinary infrastructure, only a, a, an avenue. But the combination between the avenue and the occupation, as I call the, the, the buildings along the avenue, and the program, especially of those buildings, made it a very, very powerful space. And very simple measures like closing the road, you, you are already very used to do that in, in North America, can build up a very, very strong public space. So the first project that I'm going to show, it's a design having those problems and those, um, let's say, agenda, that agenda in mind, which is the reurbanization of this creek, Antonico, that crosses uh, this area, which is a favela, important one, very central in Sao Paulo, very close to the governor's palace, for instance, among, uh, among a, a, a rich neighborhoods besides. And nowadays, it, it's impossible to locate the river because it's behind, uh, below the, the houses. That picture was here. So again, the same picture. And here we can see the river. The river actually here in this picture, the amount of water, the flow of water here is basically semi, uh, um, waste water sanit sanitation. Uh, well, you understand. We can barely see here uh, the, the, the course of the river. And every year, it's a very problematic uh, situation when the heavy rains come because the heavy rains create a, a impossible flow of water that uh, washes away several houses. That happens every year. We can see here the river. And in, in a favela, in this kind of uh, situation, we can't do the, uh, let's say, the consensus, uh, the common sense solution, a fluvial park, which should be done here. But to do that, you have to remove a lot of people. And in a favela or in, in a poor society, every vacant space, when you don't have houses for everybody, every vacant space, space in principle, is going to be used to make to make houses. So the most be, uh, big big challenge of this project was to make a public space that wouldn't be invaded again. And we started to think about that and notice that in the poor areas of the Brazilian cities, the soccer fields are the vacant spaces that resist invasion, that continues, stays like public spaces. And I think they therefore have lessons to teach us. The first one is they have a very important or indiscutable value. I don't know if I am saying right the, the word, but nobody denies that. Football is very important all over the world, especially in Brazil. Um, they also have uh, another quality, which is the legibility, the, the very simple and precise geometry that has to be that to, to allow the, the game. So this is the second lesson, le lesson, very legible shape for the public space, very clear borders in between the public and the private. Those borders are very clear in the historical city, the European one, for instance, some American cities also, but in the cities 
in developing developing countries, this is a very problematic um, limit normally. And as I said, in Europe, we have very beautiful examples of public spaces that have those quality, those qualities, the very legible shape and the very powerful use or value. Uh, so th those are the lessons that the, the third one, perhaps also very important, uh, more and more important in our present days is the flexibility in terms of use, because this uh, is a very simple space, therefore can be used for several, several uh, organizations and situations. Nowadays, or not nowadays, uh, this time during the pan pandemic, this favela was very successful in uh, combat, com uh, combating the, the, the pandemic because they could organize themselves. And I think one of the tools for this organization was a, a space like this that could gather all the leaders in order that they could talk having the social, uh, social distance, the adequate distance. So the proposal was, as it's a very delicate public space to avoid the car, to make a space for obviously active mobility and social life. Um, among the agencies, the public agencies, we agreed the size of the space, very delicate, only 10 meters in the part, in the above part of the basin, 15 meters when the river starts to be a, big, a little bit bigger. I didn't say, but this river is starting very, very close to the favela. There is not a long uh, or a big uh, basin behind the river when it crosses the favela. The removals, the houses to be removed, should be the, the minimum as possible because this is very traumatic. The people built the houses themselves, they invested a lot. So this is one of the basic concepts of uh, reurbanization of favelas, not removing people as much as possible, but obviously in between, inside the river you have to remove. It's a very dangerous situation. We propose to remove a little bit more to create a, a, a second, square in the favela. The first one is the soccer field, which is here, in the crossing of the new public space and the main commercial axis of the favela. So the removals would be around 800. And this is quite a big number. The first strategy to assign a, a, a value to that space was to generate a pragmatic value, indiscutable value a good pathway to the high capacity transport. We have this, the luck that just beside the favela, this monorail line is, is being built. In the favela, it's not ready yet. It goes like here. Uh, like here. We have a quite uh, good network of high capacity public transport that people really uh, know the value of the public transport, the high quality capacity, the high capacity and quality transport. So we said, here we can make the better way for everybody or more, um, almost everybody to the tube station, to the, to the monorail station, because the path of the water is mainly, is normally the best path for people also. They don't make stupid uh, itineraries going up and down because the water doesn't do this. So we proposed first to, to have this very good way to the transportation. Also, we have this line, this is already operating. So since the inauguration, that would be a very pragmatic value. And this is the most important line in Sao Paulo nowadays because it's the one that crosses all the other lines. It, it, it's sort of the key that closed the chain and it's in, in biking distance. So also we proposed to, to make a cycle route and a cycle lane, completing the network of cycle lanes, bike lanes in the area. Second strategy, most uh, maybe better, more attractive for us architects and more difficult is to make the, the, the place attractive and we thought the river attractive. In Sao Paulo, generally the water is not attractive, attractive at all because it's very much polluted. So uh, on the contrary of the coast of Brazil, where people really enjoy the water, and we have that in our culture. Everybody wants this. Also, I think what is really nice here 
maybe not in this picture, it's a little bit scary, especially nowadays, but it's not the water itself, but it's the people themselves. Uh, people is, is something really, really attractive. So, and, and water gathers people, as we know. So we thought we have to make a, met, a better river than this kind of river, which are the normal solution for the rivers in favelas. And that happens mainly because in urban situations, you know, the var variation of the flow is radi radical. A natural variation would be like one to two, but the urban variation is like one to 10. And in a river like this one, at the beginning of the basin, very impermeable surroundings, it's one to 200. So it's a very difficult canal because you have liters per second normally, and suddenly in the heavy rains, you have meters, cubic meters per second. In, in this case, 50 liters per second estimation and 18 cubic meters per second in the heavy rains. This is very, very dangerous. So we proposed to make two canals, one for the bad water, as we call it, and another one for the good ones, uh, for the good water, both working, reacting, let's say, changing with, with the heavy rains, with the rains. I will explain better. So you have this kind of occupation, very problematic for the water. Uh, I forgot how do you call it? The runoff pollution here is really, 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 really heavy. Not only the runoff, also the domestic pollution because of the sanitation. But in the surroundings, they have rich areas and very well not in the sense of architecture or even of the urban form, but in terms of the quality of the, 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 the construction, very good urbanization of the rich areas. So we, we divided the river in two sections. The first section, together with the springs, going to the superior channel, where is the good water. When it rains, that part of the basin goes there and also obviously the contribution of the public space itself. This means uh, permanent flow in the small canal, two, square, uh, two cubic, cubic meters in the bigger canal, and then the bigger contribution of the problematic basin going to the, under, to the inferior channel, which is uh, hidden because it, it's a polluted water because of the runoff pollution at least for the time being. And more problematic than that, it's a violent water because of the cubic meters that we have to transport. So here it goes 16 cubic meters. Here two, uh, sorry, I have to go back. 0.7 meters per second of speed for the water. This is also important here, three meters per second of speed and 16 met uh, cubic meters. If someone gets here, it's going to be death, uh, dead because it's impossible to, to live with, with, with this water. That's why we have this connection because the big, big rains, they don't fit the micro drainage system. So they go superficially to the, to the canal, to the natural part of the topography for the water, for the canal. And without this link, that very uh, problematic water will be above ground. The third strategy is to make the public space very legible. This is more or less the situation that will occur after the removals. The houses won't be prepared for the new public space. So we made a line which has a very, um, let's say, a nice flavor made by the history. It's not a, a, a perfect line, but it's a very visible line and said the houses that will remain or new constructions can occupy this strip in order that the city is prepared for the new public space. To uh, enforce that, we propose to build a public facade, porticus, having the columns as marks of the uh, land organization. And uh, since the beginning, the people could use this portico to make a veranda and already start to offer uh, things for the people in the public space or also to enjoy this relationship, but to open and to create a very intense relationship between the public and the private. This is a technical drawing. drawing. 
um, a preview of this. And actually the idea is that the portico with the, the ears is going to be eaten, let's say, by the, the constructions and won't appear. A more detailed case uh, defined in the final design, I will go very uh, briefly through it. The creek, the ratification, the removals, the fragmented space that uh, results, the lines that we want to have separating the public and the pri private, the expansions, small ones for existing houses, expansions and adaptations, a little bit, bit bigger ones for mixed uh, use units, commercial and, and maybe houses on top, um, a little bit bigger, 45 to 75 squ square meters of land for stacked houses and some commercial use in the ground floor and bigger ones for some collective housing. With this strategy, not only we make a, a better relationship between the public and the private, but also we are able to put back 140 families in the same area as they were. A very simple um, landscape design, only pavement and a lot of what uh, trees, very important, the, the green for the favelas, delicate, no uh, park on the ground, but a lot of forest, a, a lot of uh, trees. The central square, and in the central square, we propose to have a not permanent water, but when the flow is bigger, it's not going to go through this normal uh, canal. There is a, a small dam here, only when it goes up a little bit, then it goes. So it makes a temporary uh, body of wat water, which is quite nice. Have in mind that this is going to be a water that people can at least get closer because it's not polluted and it's not violent. Second project, I am seeing that I am a little bit late, is made with Mendes da Rocha, a very important project, uh, I think, very nice, a leisure center in Sao Paulo downtown. And the first idea was to put the swimming pool on top of the building and the theater on underground. The swimming pool to make this landscape more joyful, obviously, having also the sunlight all the time, not in the shadows, in the shadows that it would be if it would be on the ground floor. And the theater in underground to, to operate independently of the rest of the leisure center. It's in Sao Paulo downtown. It's a, a retrofit, let's say, or a, a adaptation of an existing building, building of the 40s, having this U shape and a patio inside. We took everything of the patio out, also the small annexes that were built. And we incorporated this small parcel here to make a service area for the whole building here and proposed this uh, public building having several programs stacked, like uh, small buildings, one on, to on top of other, we are going to see. This is the last existing lab. The void was occupied for the big areas that the program demanded. Um, and this is already the building of the tank of the swimming pool. So we were able to put that because we have very uh, powerful columns in the, in the void, in the center, in the courtyard, four columns you are going to see in the plans and also some new structure in the perimeter uh, for, for the swimming pool to avoid several columns. We made this truss that is um, to, uh, supporting all that. As I said, the program worked like, uh, like stacked buildings. You have three, four floors for each part of the program, this is in Portuguese, but maybe most of you can understand the swimming pool. This is the complex of the swimming pool. This is dance, sports. This is healthcare uh, for the dent, uh, for the teeth. Um, it's a, it's and the most important element in this case for the connection, let's say the most important service was this void full of ramps that people use to connect everything. It, it's not very nice in a public building when the programs are connected because they, they are uh, synergic. One, for instance, the restaurant 
depends on the rest of the program because the, it depends on of this public. And using a combination of the lifts stopping in some floors and the ramps to circulate in between the, 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 the floors, especially the floors connected to, to the same program, uh, it works perfectly, this uh, circulation. Also, it's very beautiful to go up and then go down seeing all those programs that we uh, saw in the diagram. It's a very good, nice facade, the internal one that creates, I think, this kind of filter that uh, makes a proper relationship between the leisure center and the offices behind, uh, beside. As you can see, it's an area that is not fully renovated. So this building is very important for that also. Uh, as in all modern cities, the, the center has a lot of passageways, galleries that people can use. So we propose the ground floor also as a free passage. This is very good for inviting people in. Uh, actually, this is also possible because we are in a tropical, tropical country where you don't have to close buildings. This can be permanent, permanently open. There is a big window in the corner and a crossway, as I saw, a, a shortcut, let's say, as I said, behind it. The facade is very simple, uh, glazing. Not, we didn't intend as, as mirrored as it is at the end, but I think this is very good because the roads are very narrow. So at the end, it gets very contextualist because, because it's reflecting the neighbors and it becomes part of the landscape. The ground floor, like a urban passageway, having this, it's a store here that sells services and goods of the institution. And lifts, ramps, the stairs for the theater. I will show the pictures. They, I think, are more uh, clarifying than the explanations and even of the plans. There is a theater, as I said, in the underground, not a traditional one, not having the scene, uh, the box for the scene, but having sides that help the, the scenes. Obviously, cafes, all the services behind. We decided to make all the installations very uh, present, apparent, very easy to, to keep, to maintain. Uh, administration and waiting areas for administration, restaurant in the existing floor that has had a, a higher height. Uh, it's beautiful, this narrow road, you have sometimes like uh, buildings that are almost touching. Uh, in Brazil, you can make those very interesting spaces that are almost like outside, inside the building. So there is no windows in this floor and it's like a big veranda for many kinds of use. Library, as the building had a lot of columns, we use the columns for the furniture. So as much as possible, we found the strategies to make the columns and good values, let's say positive things instead of negative interferences. Everything which is new is in concrete, apparent. Everything which is existing is painted in white. This is the gallery, art show, exhibition for art. It's interesting also and very important, the gaps that the, the project uh, created in order that you can link all the floors, sometimes having very, um, very high uh, spaces, building up nice views. This is the workshops attached to the exhibition hall to the cultural center. This is the floors for the arts, two, three floors for the arts. Oh, again, the, the furniture taking profit out of the columns. Dental clinic, I, I think this is funny. A beautiful relationship between the service building and the main building, all the uh, restrooms and deposits are there. Only when you have the demand for big uh, restrooms, they come to the big uh, building. This is uh, the last floor for sports, which is dense. Sorry, no, this is the, under, the, the, the first floor for sports having double height here, as I said, 
in the courtyard, we always have the bigger spaces supported by those four columns. Then you have the columns in the perimeter. So you can have this kind of situation. All the time changing the, 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 the practices because depending on the furniture, you can change. So those are the smaller rooms for sports. And as I said, restrooms come in the main space when they are bigger and they need more space. So we have restrooms for the sports. The finishing finishes have to vary depending on the use. This is for them, so the wooden floor is very uh, convenient. Again, the columns helping the furniture to, to be stable. And then the complex of the swimming pool, which is a very small area for a big, for a nice swimming pool. So we made three floors for that. The shadow with a cafe and the small uh, water mirrors that at the end became like small swimming pools for, for the kids. Then more or less in between the, the big structure that we need for the water tank the restrooms and all the machinery that you need for the swimming pool. And then the swimming pool, uh, the service building goes on with all the machinery that the building demands. And as the program vary a lot, the finishings also vary. I think the furniture play a, a big role in this building to link everything, to connect everything. It was designed by us, uh, inspired by this piece that was all over the, the works. The, design, the furniture was designed in the last year of the works, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. And Mendes da Rocha, as you know, uh, already made very, uh, not, not, not ma many, but some very successful experiences uh, using metal, using steel for, for furniture. This is a beautiful chair based on the Breuer chair, but having a hammock, sort of hammock here. Maybe one of, uh, maybe some of you know the, the chair using the metallic technique. So we use the, the metallic and the triangle when possible for solving th those furniture tables. rounded, triangled chairs, combining steel and aluminum when we needed not uh, too heavy pieces. Always taking profit of the elasticity of the material. The sofa, as we call, and it has this long steel uh, plate making those bands in order that the elasticity is bigger and also making a sort of that you, you can have the seats reversed and still have a, a continuous seat here. Well, not the seat, but the backs reversed as you are going to see in order that people can talk associated sometimes with small tables. And also using the same seat, we made like a big chair. They are heavy on purpose because it's a public building. So people don't, uh, people shouldn't be moving all the time the furniture around. Only the small chairs should be light. That, that's why we used aluminum in the, in the chair and the, in the rest is steel. And sometimes the, the big chair also is for garden, having a lower height. I will go very quickly through this project. It's not important at all. The importance of this is because uh, I think the biggest role for us architects in general in Latin America, also taking care of the urban space and the infrastructures, but to work with the private work, private initiative, the real estate, the uh, individuals initiative, because this is what makes cities. So, for, it took a long time for us to get in this market, 
now in Brazil, the real estate market is hiring nice architecture. I'm not saying we are nice, but they are hiring. And in the past, in the recent past, they were not doing that. And I think that's because we also learned, I'm saying the architects in general, to talk better to, to those people. This is in Santiago do, do Chile, not in Brazil, in Chile. And it's a typical building for uh, residential, uh, residential use, ground floor for common use, then four floor, four departments per floor. Um, always important the veranda, especially nowadays. The first floor has a small, smaller plan because of regulations. And the roof, not the roof, the penthouse, I think it's a very nice uh, interlocked solution that, that the departments are sharing the same, sorry, the same veranda and having something which I think is very, very nice, which is the double front. People can see more that of the city. And I think this is very, very nice when we can achieve. And a small uh, garden on the rooftop. And the last project is a project which we are now building is the Brazilian pavilion in Dubai. It was meant to be open right now, 2020, October, but it was postponed, the, the, uh, the whole uh, venue, the whole exhibition was postponed to, to 21. So we are under construction now. We decided because it was a competition, national competition that had to present not only the architecture of the pavilion, but also the contents, the basic content, the curatorial approach. So we decided to show the Brazilian water, but not the, the one that is very famous, the Atlantic water, but the fresh water of Brazil, which is an immense reserve. 7% of the fresh water of the world is in Brazil and under threat now, as you know, the Amazonic basin, the, also the Pantanal, as we call. So this is a very important and very beautiful uh, natural richness that we have, and I think it's global. So uh, the water was also thought as something very important for our culture, but also as a very important or very powerful architectural element, material, as we know including with this Venetian situation, Venice in Italy, every now and then is underwater, as you know, the aqua alto, aqua alta phenomenon, which is very famous among Brazilian, especially architects in Sao Paulo. We like a lot this. So we proposed the pavilion as a big water square, but as we are obviously having a small building to host the offices and the exhibitions that needed more control and a shading structure because we are in Dubai, we have to protect the water. So uh, the biggest, but the more, most efficient structure to protect, to make a shadow for that water and making with this uh, very Brazilian space, very Brazilian in terms of architecture, which is this intermediate, uh, this hybrid space, hybrid space which is also in, inside, but also outside. Uh, it's a natural climate inside, uh, under this pensile structure. And it's the most important uh, part of the pavilion for the exhibition. During the day, sorry, during the day, very light, especially in terms of light itself, very luminous, having nice shades, even of the structure. And in the night, as a big, um, screen for um, video mapping system. We are spending a lot with projectors to project whatever we decide. We don't have a good control on the content because our government is not uh, a very, uh, one that is not in favor of culture and science, as you know, but uh, they didn't change at all the, the architecture, maybe they will create a nice content, we, we lost control under that, but we have full control of the architecture and the project projectors are going to really provide this kind of situation. So the pavilion in the ground floor is only rest, uh, you, in one side, 
the big saloon having very, let's say, simple shapes that don't disturb the exhibition and making the water the main quality of this, not the form, but the material, the atmosphere. In the other side, um, a more cu curved design for the restaurant, the bar, and the shop. Uh, I didn't say, but I think it's very interesting to notice that this 50 by 50 structure has only four columns because it's very efficient structure. So it's very easy to touch the ground very little. And this is important because we have to give back the property, the, the land without any kind of construction. So the foundations should be minimal. At the end, we discovered that this foundation is a very heavy one because of the wind. So we have here a piece that resists 150 tons of traction. The first floor of the building, the internal building, having the spaces for all the conventional exhibition situations and also some support for the people, a veranda to look at this big space. And then all the offices for the diplomatic service of the pavilion and also the journalists we will find here support for their activities. Uh, and then on the top of the building, all the machinery, because this is natural climate. So we can put the machinery for the air conditioning here, for instance. The facades, are very simple. Um, this is not noticeable here, but in the human scale is going to be noticeable that this is the column and the next one is going to be only in the other facade. So this is basically floating above the water mirror. That's also a, an important uh, thing for the water to reflect, to, to show this lightness of the structure. A scheme of the projectors, so they are sometimes very powerful and very few, and sometimes a lot for projecting in, in the roof, for instance, or in the facades when the building is very close to the membrane, to the tensile structure, when the internal buildings like this. So it's going to vary during the more uh, cultural events in the water and the whole atmosphere and in the night, the projections seen from outside, as you are going to see. This is the main, one of the main pavilions of the Expo, the sustainability pavilion. That's why water is the issue here, designed by Nicholas Grimshaw. And this picture is, it came today. I wanted to show you, they are almost finishing the, the main structure for the tensile structure. I will play a small video now, and that, that's the end of the presentation. There is no sound. Don't worry, Jaime. It's a very simple shape for the building, uh, like in most of the Brazilian architecture, the structure playing a very important role in terms of the expression of the architecture. Um, we, at the beginning, said the ideas travel, not the materials. So we made, let's say, a Brazilian architecture having this 
principles of the Brazilian architecture using the materials and the whole production chain of Dubai. All, all, in Brazil, we also have tensile structures, but maybe not the video mapping as powerful as this one. And the building with the projections is going to change a lot. We can make several buildings using that resource. The membrane is translucent, so the image is going to be seen from outside as well. Thank you very much. So, uh, now we're going to introduce Roberto Bejar, Luis Sosa, and Alice Timmering, and they will be asking you some questions. Okay. Oh, Milton, can you can you stop sharing your screen? Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Milton, uh, thank you so much for participating in our class on behalf. Uh, actually, this is taking up a part of the class that I give every Wednesday, and uh, I'm very appreciative to, to have the opportunity. I, on behalf of our, our, our students, I want to thank you for this beautiful work that you showed. Uh, I got to tell you, having visited an expo, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to be a Fulbright Fellow in 1991-92 when to Barcelona when the Olympics was there and then in Sevilla the World's Fair or the Expo was there. So those projects have an immense amount of meaning. That that pavilion is just wonderful. I mean every essence of that pavilion has little details that really talk about you know your culture, who you are, the essence of how it life is a big part of nature is a big part of life in brazil so i i love watching that and i and I, I i guess i loved it because i've also been to an expo and i had the pleasure of going through every pavilion at the time and you actually learn a lot about the different countries this this pavilion of yours at night is going to stand out it's going to be spectacular it will it will by nature attract people to it so I, I was very, very happy to see that. It was beautifully done. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, may I perhaps uh, comment a little bit uh, more about the pavilion? Uh, we knew that this kind of event, event uh, it's like a fair, as the name uh, says by itself. That, that is to say, um, the attractions are going to be powerful. So it, it's, it was a, a challenge to combine a very, let's say, easy attraction because you, you have to be very attractive without thinking. And uh, in the other hand, to make a, let's say, interesting architecture, interesting engineering, interesting space. And we then, I don't know if you knew the Brazilian pavilion in 2015 in Milano, it has a big net maybe the biggest net that was ever built that people could walk on it. 1,500 uh, square meters of, of this net. It, it was even a little bit dangerous, I think, but actually there was some accidents, but it was very, very po popular. It was visited by a lot of people. And we knew that we need a very sensual, let's say, or very attractive element. And then we thought maybe water can be that. But at the end, I think uh, the, the water is very, very important. As, a, as, as I said, as an architectonic material. But the, the tensile structure became the most important element. 
And when we, we discovered that we needed to protect the water to make this uh, shading structure, this hybrid space, taking almost the whole plot, actually we took everything that we could of the plot. There was some setbacks that we had to respect. The rest is roofed, it's covered by this tensile structure. And, and we thought we have to do that more or less like uh, the, the Brazilian have always done using um, structures that have a lot of uh, capacity, uh, high efficiency structures. Look, including the indigenous, I don't know if you know the Oka, the typical house for the, in, in, for the Xinguanos, for the ones in the Amazonia, or, or at least most part of Amazonia. They take very uh, delicate elements in nature, small sticks, rectilineous, but maybe long, but not heavy ones, not thick ones. And they curve, they, they tension those sticks to a um, three little, not, it's not little, not, not stone, but um, three sticks heavier, two columns and one beam. And tensioning the, the elements, they get a, a really powerful structure. So in a way, this is, a, a, an inspiration in, in the indigenous construction. Well, we were very lucky at the end, I think, because everything worked fine. Every decision led to an, a, a new solution and, and perhaps one that would make the previous solution even stronger. Like at the end, we used the tent, the big tent as a big screen. Uh, the biggest cost of the pavilion are the projectors. We have 96, 96 projectors, last generation laser projectors, different powers, uh, different powers, right? And this is half of the cost of the, the whole thing. Uh, it's very, very important. Although in terms of architecture, I prefer the, the building without projections. I think it, it's much nicer, the atmosphere, the light and the, the water without projections. But surely at, at night, this is going to be a big attraction. It depends on the contents which are not uh, controlled by us. I hope they are nice. At least they are beautiful. Thank you. I'm Milton. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture and the beautiful explaining your beautiful work. Uh, to pick up on the pavilion a little bit and your ideas of uh, what, what it means to be a Brazilian construction, right? Being Brazilian myself, I wanted to ask you a question that actually relates back to a comment that you had made on a lecture that I heard of yours when I was uh, looking into your work. You mentioned, for instance, that Renzo Piano is uh, an inspiration. However, you said that his architecture is too sophisticated for Brazil and that our construction with its limitation required um, not a simpler solution, but a less sophisticated solution. One of your projects that really shook me was the Santa Rita uh, Fazenda, the little farm in Santa Rita, where you really describe the construction as this primitive construction or very simple construction where you're using stone and wooden construction. And then from that, which is an earlier project to uh, your later projects where you're really exploring with this uh, big construction of uh, big cantilevers, uh, coffered um, uh, pre -cast, like uh, casting place concrete structures, and then all the way to your pavilion in which you, you're basically inspired as well by vernacular architecture, but then you translate that vernacular architecture in a very different way. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what you think this Brazilian construction, this Brazilian structure is really like and how has it affected your work and how has it evolved from maybe a more vernacular take or this more simple inspiration from the Brazilian architecture all the way to, you know, through CES and then the pavilion at the end. Thank you. Uh, you, you know very well our work because the <laughs> Santa Rita house is an old one and, and it was not built. And um, once Sofia da Silva Teles, a Brazilian critic, said it was a urban, not urban, but um, contemporary house using traditional materials. 
a contemporary prog program as or pro problem using traditional materials. And that house has a very clear um, quality that I don't know if we knew when we were designing, it's almost more than 20 years ago, but it has like two times the vernacular material, they are very heavy and they are permanent. And then it's inside you have small divisions, light divisions that, that can change all the time. And I think this um, happens a lot in, in some of our masters like Lina Bobardi, this that I'm saying, this is think the architecture as more uh, almost like an infrastructure that can be adapted. Actually, there is this critic in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, Flavio Mota, who named those spaces as uh, significant spaces without a name, because they don't have a name after a predefined uh, activity. They are not schools, hospitals, but they are very powerful. They are very specific in terms of architecture, in terms of, of space, and very capable of hosting several uses. Not all, all of uses, obviously, one example to make this uh, more clear is the Lina's Von Livre free span of the museum. Most of you probably know that space. And it's very powerful. It's named after the quality of the architecture, not of the activity. And in a way, that house has a little bit of that, thinking that what we were designing, probably, especially in a farm, would last for centuries, perhaps. And we don't know whatever we are going to be in 10, 5, well, 50 years. I, I always say that to my students. Our reality is a very peculiar one. It's a reality of 50 years. So probably what we have to do nowadays is to think of the basic qualities of architecture, the ones that don't, don't change. Like Shakespeare wrote about the qualities or the passions of humanity that are not changing at all. So architects, more and more, we have to discover what those issues are in order to design, because otherwise we are going to make buildings that are going not, uh, are, are going not, they are not going to cope with the reality, with the future. This is the first idea. I, I think your question, which is a very good one, opens a lot of issues that we could discuss. But I think the second one, which is worth mentioning, and it's a lesson that Alejandro Aravena, after all, we are, we are all Americans. We are basically looking at the future because we don't have a long past, especially Brazil and the, the Latin, Latin countries. Our past is one that is not really worth paying. We have to pay attention, not to preserve, but to, not, to, not, not to repeat. And Aravena said something uh, once, which is, uh, very present in our culture. We know that it was not a revelation, but it, it was very well said. We need to do a, an architecture that is basically action, not object, not almost like making programs only, uh, pro programming actions without spending too much money. Our money has to be multiplied. And I think this is very present in the Brazilian architecture. Uh, Obviously, sometimes it, it's more expensive. This pavilion is not cheap at all, especially the projectors. The pavilion itself is it, quite cheap, probably half of the average price of the, the neighbors. But with the projectors, it's going to be as, as expensive probably as, as the others. So this demand for very efficient, but not in the engineering way or in the pragmatic way, but in the architectonic way of the investment, I think it's a challenge that, that shapes the Brazilian architecture. And in the other hand, we are perhaps uh, not really expanding the, the, the limits of architecture like other countries are doing because they, they can do and they have to do testing new alternatives. We are repeating perhaps with more, uh, more refinement because we are using the, this know-how we are repeating some solutions. I don't think the pavilion, for instance, is a revolutionary solution. It's more or less the same solution uh, using contemporary idea, contemporary possibilities, especially the video mapping. Thank you. Um, again, muito, muito obrigado por uh, your lecture today. 
it's uh, fantastic to have a Brazilian architecture here at our School of Architecture. And I say that not only because I'm half Brazilian, but most importantly, because Brazilian architecture has a role to play in our own city that, that could be quite important. And in fact, there is, and I'm speaking with you also to our students who are, you know, by the hundreds looking at our, your presentation, but also because there is, a there is a relationship between Brazil and the architecture of Brazil and the architecture of Miami that uh, has existed since the 50s with an architect like uh, Morris Lapidus in Miami Beach, who travels to Brazil, goes to, goes to, um, goes to Rio, and I think he must have gone to, to Higienopolis in particular because of the buildings that you have there. And I have always, I have always, I have always wondered about the relationship between the so-called School of Rio and the School of Sao Paulo. And, and in general, what one reads in this relationship between the architecture of Rio and the architecture of Sao Paulo is that it's based on style. So people speak about, you know, brutalism, for instance, in the case of, in the case of Sao Paulo and they speak about the sensuous character of the lines of Ian Meyer and others in Rio. But today you taught me something, I think, or at least I have the hint of a really important discovery for me at least, and I'd like you to elaborate upon, upon that. And it is that the architecture of Sao Paulo in the last, let's say 50 years since perhaps it's a beautiful project by Nian Meyer actually in Itapoeira, the EG and the Parque de Itapoeira, I think it's called. It, 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 Itapoeira. Huh? Yeah, the, the gallery. And I mean, not the building, but the gallery itself. A, a building like, uh, like the one by the Escuela, the Escola de Arquitectura by, by Archigas. You know? And most importantly, what I would call a plaza within, it's kind of a square, covered square within. The project that you mentioned by Linda Movardi, which is the project of a museum, but in fact, it becomes a square and a terrace that complements the park in front. Now the square, the, the very green park in front. Uh, um, the project, for instance, like, um, and your own projects, and your own projects, the project with the swimming pool, the Seski, of course, Lina Seski as well. In all of these projects, in all of these projects, I think that the most important element of this project, which could be seen as a tradition, is the incorporation of the of public space within the architecture of the building. And the dominance, in a way, of public space over, over all architectural features. And in a way, this provides a life to the building, actually. It provides a link between architecture and life, architecture and the city, in a way, that perhaps is not as clear when one looks at uh, the architecture of Rio, for instance. So it's more than, more than a question of uh, forms. I see a tradition linked to the construction of public space in Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo that I don't see as strong perhaps in, in Rio. And, um, and uh, to me, that's, that's something that I have learned today with your presentation. So I wanted to, wanted to really thank you about your work and, and this lesson that at least I have learned today. And perhaps if you could elaborate about it, I would really be thankful. Thank you. Um, you made a very uh, clear um, description and observation of uh, the Brazilian architecture and even of the difference between Rio and Sao Paulo. And I think Sao Paulo has a, a, a school. Of Hi, Jaime. I don't know if they are still hearing at me, uh, to me. Are they? So I will continue. Uh, in Sao Paulo, we have a school in the sense of the continuity and the unfolding uh, of ideas, the unfolding uh, work of, of ideas, or a know-how, more than know-how, a culture. 
and I think we have that maybe because our masters, they were teachers, like Lina, Lina, not as much, but Paulo, Mendes da Rocha, Artigas, they were teachers. And in Rio de Janeiro, there, were one, there was one dominant figure that was Oscar Niemeyer, wh whose architecture is very difficult to unfold. I think this is maybe one of the reasons for the difference. Uh, in general, the second observation, which I think is very, very good, of, um, I, I don't know his name, sorry. Um, is that Roberto. Roberto? Many, many Brazilian buildings, especially the ones that are more important, open to the public, public buildings or buildings of public use, they incorporate of uh, some of the public space or the urban space internally. And I think that happens because our weather, our climate allows. So we are very good in doing this transition between inside and outside, or normally thought in the opposite way, the outside into inside. The, the School of Architecture of Sao Paulo has no gates. It's impossible to close the school and it's impossible to say where is out and where is inside, where is outside and where is inside. Uh, many houses, not only public buildings, many houses, especially Mendes da Rocha is very good on do, in doing that, bringing the outside into uh, the inner part of the building. And I think that happens because it's beautiful mainly, because we can do that, because we have this tropical weather, tropical climate, but also because our city is very poor. And since uh, we need to complete our city, to, we need to build our city. I think every architect is trying to make the city uh, very present in, in the architecture. Because I'm saying like this, because normally those spaces, they are not really helping the city to improve, especially in the houses, for instance. They are more uh, functioning like a statement than a, a, a contribution, a real contribution or a, a public space a real public space. But I think they are really important, not only for the architecture, but also to create um, maybe the most important thing, which is the conscious, consciousness, not only among architects, but among everybody that the city matters. The city is the most important uh, construction that humanity has done. Where, where, where we, Brazil, 90% of the people, almost 90% is, is living in cities. Argentina is 94, I think. Latin countries, they are very much urban. And uh, this is perhaps a, a big aspect of the, those countries. It, it's good to be in the cities. Obviously now with the pan pandemic, we, we, pandemic, we have to review some, some aspects, but uh, it, it is important. And I think you're right. All the buildings that you mentioned, they have this that our critic calls uh, significant spaces without a name. The School of Architecture has the Caramel Hall. It's called Caramel because of the color of the pavement. The Ibirapuera Park designed by Nehemiah has this gallery, which can only be uh, assigned or named as gallery. There is no other name for that. Uh, we, saw, we, we said about the, the, uh, the, Sesc, the, the Museum of Lina. And going back to the first idea, when I, I, I talked about the Santa Rita farmhouse, and more and more, I think what really matters in architecture is to define let's say, I don't know if you have this word, ontolo ontological aspects of architecture, the ones that are there always. That's why including the traditional materials many times perform better than the, the very technological materials. Still, a, a wall of stones is very good for, for the building. But uh, I was going to stress that um, in those buildings, we can see very important and permanent decisions, like placing the swimming pool in the roof. This is what really matters in, in a project. 
I think, especially in countries like Brazil, that has to make the, the, the money uh, to uh, value each cent that is spent. So it's not, not a question of really depending on forms or very uh, in sophistic, sophisticated techniques. We, we think Piano is a great, great guy. And probably if he goes to Brazil, like many of good architects when went to Brazil, they, they knew how to play. They, they didn't use um, very expensive elements because this is not the case there. And I think in, in situations like in Europe, this is the case. We have to expand our field. We have to test our field. So it depends where you are. In Dubai now, we, 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 were, we thought that we were able to, for the first time, to, to use things that we would never use in, in Brazil. And I think the most important thing at the end, just to conclude my speech, my, my talk, is that we have to understand where we are. Architecture is very much dependent on the place. Uh, I have been saying, I have been even writing that architecture is much more related to the place than to the time because our time is a long, long, long time. So thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you very much, uh, Mishra. Uh, the students, who are students? Any of the students have any questions? No? Yes? Yes, please. So what we, my question is this, when it comes down to the pandemic, I mean, what do you think can you can you, can you move close to the microphone, please? Yes, I couldn't understand. Please, uh, louder and, and very slow. Okay. The, the question that I have is, is that with the ongoing issue with the pandemic, I mean, it, we hear about it every day and the differences and the problems that are coming up, uh, between people. We know how it's kind of affecting people in the United States and it's starting to become a subject here, but how is it affecting uh, people in Brazil and with the way that the architecture and the, the, the future of the city is going? I mean, it is a very condensed city with a, and a very high population for a small area. Uh, what kind of position is your company taking or what kind of position do you guys stand on going forward in addressing um, it, it, the it, possible um, outbreaks or anything that could happen in the future to kind of affect the, the status of um, people in their livelihood. Okay, I, I don't know if I fully understood the, the question because um, it wasn't very easy to understand, but uh, I think I can comment. And uh, as everywhere, differences are becoming more problematic. In Brazil, all kinds of differences maybe the, the most difficult one is the social difference, the, the, the difference between incomes. And we have a big housing problem in Brazil. This is, the, the, let's say, the urban face of this social difference. Not only the lack of housing, but also the distribution of the population. And I think that the most important uh, measure that architects can take or the most uh, important effect that our work can have, can has, can have, sorry, is to change uh, urban culture or to change the mind of people. We have this sort of joke that says the most important infrastructure, infrastructure that we have to change is the infrastructure of the mentality. Um, I'm saying that because when it, it becomes a consensus that this is a social problem, not a problem of the ones that have the problem. It, it's going to be solved, like transportation, public transportation. Nowadays, every country defends uh, public transportation with quality uh, because this became a, a consensus. So I, I think this is very important to act when you, you are talking about major problems. The only solution, I think that the real solution or the most effective solution even for architects and urbanists, at the, the solutions related to the culture, to, to the common sense, to the consensus more than the, every, anything else, like a co collective consciency. Mm -hmm. uh, another aspect that I would like to add to, to, to our consideration 
is that the, the, I think especially urbanism, but maybe also architecture can be very powerful in diminishing the, the differences among people. The most uh, valuable spaces in Rio de Janeiro, for instance, the beaches are the spaces where everybody goes. Nobody's prepared to give up um, the beach, for instance. In Sao Paulo, the, the park, the Ibirapuera Park, probably in New York, Central Park or the new parks along the, the waterfront are the places where people meet, that the people coexist. And I think this is something very important. Uh, maybe it's a little bit obvious, but for instance, social housing in Brazil, we are defending to put social housing beside the, the metro stations, not because of the metro is going to be a very important service for, for the, those inhabitants that need a social housing, need the, the help of the government to buy his, uh, the house, but because around the tube stations, the metro stations, everybody is going to be there and to be worried about the quality of the city. And therefore there will be a social care of those, uh, those social complexes. I, th I think it's a little bit obvious, but I, I think it's always worth to mention the Jane Jacobs idea of the eyes uh, in the city work in, in both directions, not only the people in the buildings looking at the streets, but also the streets looking at the buildings. So the most valuable streets where everybody go, like going to the metro station, are the places where we should put the most vulnerable uses of the city. Obviously, this is only a, a basic concept, has to be adjusted for every program and for every situation. But I don't know if I could understand your question properly, but I wanted to speak about those issues regarding difference. Okay, thank you very much. We don't want to take more of your time. Uh, on behalf of Technoglass and the School of Architecture, Professor Behar, Professor Simrin, Professor Sosa, and Dean Elfuri, and the students here present, and all of those of you that are out there on the web, uh, thanks a lot, and please join us again uh, for another lecture with Lin Hao from Singapore on Wednesday, a week from today at 7 p.m. Uh, thank you, Milton, and wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, all of you. It was a pleasure for me. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.